So welcome everyone to this week's The Future Speaks event. Today we're going to be covering the Mid-Scotland and Fife electoral region. This is the fourth event in the series, which will be covering each region within Scotland before the Scottish Parliament elections in May. My name is Jack Bell, my pronouns are he, him, and I'll be chairing the event tonight. I'm 18 and I'm a Scots law student at the University of Glasgow, and I'm also the member of the Scottish Youth Parliament for Perthshire South and Kinrosshire. I became interested in, in, in environmental issues thanks to the Fridays for Future movement, and I slowly began to get more involved, attending two climate strikes, helping to deliver grassroots actions for our last campaign within SYP and taking part in the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's webinars on the Circular Economy for Teenagers series. Tonight, we're going to be focusing on the climate and ecological emergency and how Scotland will respond to these crises. As we should all know, Scotland is poised to host COP26 this year, meaning the eyes of the world will fall on us. So the pressure is really on to be world leaders in this area. This has been organized entirely by a group of young activists through Teach the Future and aims to bring us young people, regardless of whether we can vote, and you decision makers together to discuss environmental issues and more generally, to put young people's concerns on the political radar. The way this event will work is that I will call on our three young panelists to field questions to you based on the opinions of young people within the region. You'll have about a minute to respond to the, these questions and You'll, there will be a timer that goes off after 90 seconds, so we'll cut you off there um, if you're going on a little bit too long. So I'd now like to ask our panelists to introduce themselves, um, and then following that, I will ask our guest politicians to introduce themselves. Um, so Tess, shall we start with you? Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Tess Corcoran. I'm 17 years old, and I use she, her pronouns. Um, I got involved in climate activism in March 2019 through the Fridays for Future Scotland um, climate strike movement and I'm a campaign coordinator with Teach the Future Scotland. Um, I'm really passionate about the climate crisis and specifically the idea of climate justice and I really hope that today can give us a chance to ask questions and get some good um, promises from, from the politicians. So thank you all for coming. Amazing, thank you. Um, Caroline, would you like to go next? Caroline, my pronoun. I think we might be experiencing a technical issue on... Oh, Caroline, are you okay to um, just introduce yourself again? Sorry, I think there was a technical problem. Um, sorry, my Zoom's gone a bit funny. Um, I'm Caroline, my pronouns are she, her. I'm 16 and I'm a Teach the Future. Um, I got into like climate issues through striking and um, I'm Carl Harris at Kinross High School and I'm really excited to be here and to hear what everybody has to say on these really important issues, especially in the run up to the election. Thank you so much. Um, and finally, Orla. Um, hi, my name is Orla Amford. I am 16. I use she, her pronouns, and I live in Kineswood in Perth and Kinross. Um, I am a volunteer at Teach Future Scotland, as I am very passionate and equally scared about the climate crisis and its huge injustices. So I am very excited to have this opportunity to ask these questions and hear from all of you tonight. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so now we're going to move on to our guest politicians. Um, and first up, we have Alex Rowley, MSP. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Rowley, and I'm uh, currently a Labour MSP for Mid Scotland and Fife. And in the forthcoming election, I'm the candidate for the Cowden Beath constituency in Fife and uh, on the list for Labour's list for the Mid Scotland and Fife. And uh, it's really good to be here tonight. And, to hear what everyone else has to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Malcolm Wood. Hi there, I am Malcolm. I'm the Scottish Liberal Democrat candidate also for Cowdenbeath. Um, I, my day job, I'm a 
computer programmer for a multinational software company and we write software for engineering and science and education. Um, I'm dad to two small boys at primary school. Um, many years ago, I was a, a pupil at Inverkeething High School. I've been taking a close interest in climate change ever since I learned about it there in the 1990s. One of the reasons I got involved in politics is because I'm frustrated at how easily climate change gets forgotten about and I joined the Liberal Democrats partly because I thought they were the party with the most realistic approach to tackling it. So thanks for having me on your panel. I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion. Thank you so much. Um, next up, we have Mark Ruskell, MSP. Right, hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name is Mark Ruskell. I'm Green MSP for Mid Scotland Fife. I live uh, in Dune to the west of Stirling. Um, I first got elected 2003 and I put forward the first ever proposal for climate change targets back then. Um, seemed like a bit of a far out proposal, but um, you know, now the laws changed several times to incorporate them. Um, I lost my seat in 2007, was a councillor uh, for the Green Party in Stirling, which was really interesting, gave me a perspective on local politics. And then I got re-elected in 2016 uh, back to Holyrood. Since then, I've been sat on the Environment Committee and we've been dealing with climate legislation and the nature emergency since then. So that's me, thanks. Looking forward to hearing what you're going to say. Thank you. And finally, we have Jenny Gilruth, MSP. Hi, Jack, um, and good afternoon. Good evening to everyone. My name is Jenny Gilruth, and I'm the MSP for the Mid Fife and Glenrothes constituency. Um, before I was elected in 2016, I was a modern studies teacher. So I'm really keen to hear your questions today around about education and the importance of that in terms of teaching about uh, the climate crisis. Uh, thank you for having me along today and um, looking forward to the event. Thanks. Thank you all so much. It's been really interesting to hear about your backgrounds before you got into politics as well. Um, and we feel that it could absolutely be something relevant to you know how interested you are in climate change and the issues surrounding the environment. So um, I don't think we should waste any more time. We should jump straight into our first question, which I believe comes from Tess. Thank you, Jack. Um, with only two recognised cities in the region, many young people are dependent on the currently insufficient public transport systems that are, that are in place at the moment. How would you improve the reliability and the environmental sustainability of these systems to ensure that young people specifically can get move around sustainable, sustainably and easily? Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to go in an order um, and we'll keep cycling through you um, so that someone different's going first each time. Um, so Alex Drowley, you are first for this question. Okay, thank you. I mean, one of the, the, the key issues around transport, particularly if you live, I mean, I live in Kelty and there is no train station here. There is a, a bus service that, that is reasonable, but if you had a job, say up in Glenrothes or or Kirkcaldy or whatever, you're talking about having to get a few buses to get to your work. So, in terms of transport, what we need is we certainly need joined up transport, um, and we have seen progress being made on that. So, for example, in in Mid Scotland and Fife, you have the large park and ride at Hobbies that allows you to go elsewhere, and I think. Pre the pandemic, we were starting to see more sort of joined up approach to to public transport linking up with the rail stations. But I think if we were going to be radical in trying to address these issues, the, the, the one of the things we would do is we would take control of the railways and bring them in under public control. Now we can do that. The government have served notice on, on the, the current operators of ScotRail and therefore you could have a public sector bid there. You need the investment going in and as I say you need joined up. I was looking at an old photo the other day, uh, Kelty and the, the, the railway back in the 19, I think it was the early 1960s before I was born and you saw the railway station, et cetera. And my dad, his first job when he left the army was on the railways and he would walk to his work down the road. So 
so we we saw you know the the a lot of the railways disappear so for serious about public transport i do think public ownership plays a key part but secondly i think you need the investment to go alongside that and you need to recognize that public transport has to join up so that people living in rural mid scotland and fife are able to use that public transport and get to where they're going so take the railways into public control put the local authorities back in charge of the buses um, and invest. That's what needs to happen if we want to have decent public transport service and at the same time, obviously using fuels uh, that, that are not uh, making climate worse. Transport makes a big contribution to our emissions um, um, and work to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Apologies, um, we are running on quite a strict um, time limit. Um, so I would really appreciate it if we can keep our answers to um, no more than a minute and a half. But if we can be shooting for a minute, that would be um, ideal. Um, I understand we have a lot to say and it's all very interesting. Um, however, there's a lot of questions that we have to get through tonight. Um, so, um, but thank you for your answer. Um, next that we have Malcolm Wood. Thank you. Um, Liberal Democrats love trains. Uh, we are campaigning at the moment for a train line uh, to be extended from Lucas to St Andrews. Um, I think more trains would help with sustainable transport in lots of ways. We also uh, love buses and one of our current campaigns is to change bus regulations such that private bus companies can't just drop the services they think are unprofitable. Um, perhaps they would have to bid for groups of services together and promise to run the unprofitable ones along with the profitable ones that would help rural communities um, and stop the bus companies just selecting the city routes that um, that make them loads of money. Um, also, we can talk about electric cars. They're another sustainable mode of transport. They're not public transport, but um, electric cars, I think, are part of the answer to our um, transport emissions problem. There you go. Thank you. And uh, thank you for your brevity as well. Um, Next, um, Mark Raskell. Yeah, thanks. Um, so a big issue that a lot of young people talk to me about in my community is the cost of public transport. Uh, it costs 15 quid to get from where I live uh, to the centre of Stirling if you're a young adult, and it's outrageous. And that's why the Greens prioritised in our budget deal with the SNP government last year, a commitment to introduce free bus travel for under 19s, which will benefit young people in terms of accessing education, in terms of accessing jobs, leisure, but also families as well. And we'd like to extend that and go further because we think free public transport works. If you look at countries where it's been introduced, like Estonia, uh, it's making a big difference in getting that shift. So that's one thing. We uh, want to see more rail infrastructure as well. Um, so we've got uh, a win through the Scottish budget as well for a £2 million fund, which has helped communities such as Newborough and St Andrews actually do feasibility studies on opening up new rail routes but that's obviously going to take a fair bit of time to put in place but there's been practical change there and yeah I think bringing public transport into public ownership makes a lot of sense because we can start to regulate the buses there to support rural communities so I think we need all of this but we also need to listen to the experiences of young people in communities particularly rural communities as well thanks. Cool, thank you. Um, finally, Jenny Gilruth. Thanks, Zach. Um, I can't believe we've got this far talking about transport. No one's mentioned the Leavenmouth Rail Link. So the Leavenmouth Rail Link is an example of a, a train station that's going to um, reopen um, under the Scottish Government. And I think it's a hugely important example of how you can try to facilitate um, behaviour change away from cars and back onto to public transport. And that's a hugely important factor for young people because if it's not there on your doorstep, you're not going to use it. And I know that when I was growing up in Ceres, which is a small village outside Cooper, you could not get out of the village uh, in terms of public transport. The access was really, really poor. So we need to think about how we join that up. And what that led to is lots of young people my age when they were 16 or 17 learning to drive and get in cars. So if we're going to try and facilitate that behavior change, we need to make sure there's the infrastructure there. And going back to the leaving mouth example, um, the SNP has supported as well funding to help uh, Blueprint, which is going to develop active travel links, which will sit alongside the rail link. So we're not just thinking 
strictly about the rail link. We're looking at the active travel opportunities that that rail link will hopefully provide for the next uh, generation and young people yet to come. Thank you. Um, those were all brilliant responses um, and I hope the young people who are listening in um, have gotten the answers that they're looking for. Um, if not, please remember that we have a Q&A for the politicians um, in the chat um, using the Zoom webinar and we will come to those questions after the six pre-prepared questions we have tonight. So our next pre-prepared question, I believe, comes from Caroline concerning biodiversity. On the topic of biodiversity, what policy will your party put in place to ensure the protection of biodiversity in Mid Scotland and Fife's green spaces? Thank you. Um, quite an important question as well, considering some of the diverse um, species that we have within Mid Scotland and Fife. Um, so we're going to move down the list a bit. Um, so Malcolm Wood, you will be starting this question. Thanks for the question. It's an important subject. Um, <laughs> Tree planting, I think, has got to be a really important thing going forward for both reasons of climate change, carbon emissions, um, carbon capture, and for the biodiversity. So uh, from the biodiversity point of view, of course, that's not just planting the fastest growing trees, the blanket forestry of spruces, it's planting um, a wide range of, of trees. Um, we're also keen to establish more national parks. I'm not sure exactly where, possibly in Scotland and Fife. Um, national parks until now have there have been a conflict between conservation and economic development and we're keen that we could we would push it back towards conservation for new national parks um, also marine parks um, biodiversity in the seas is important um, to Scotland the, the world has improved its its um, sustainability of its fishing over recent decades but uh, marine parks would certainly help um, ensure biodiversity in our oceans thank you Thank you. Um, Mark Ruskell, we'll come to you next. So I think we need to look at how we manage the land. Uh, we need to be able to challenge some of the vested interests who manage land as well. So I would pick two things. Firstly, we need to start to change the agricultural subsidies that are paid to farmers to help them to farm in a way that's more supportive of biodiversity, that's going to tackle the nature emergency. At the moment, we fund a lot of overproduction from land. Uh, we need to shift that. If we're giving public money to landowners, it needs to support biodiversity because we are in a nature emergency. I'd also say that the days of having uplands, particularly our hills and moors, uh, turned over to driven grass, moor shooting needs to come to an end. And we need to look at rewilding those areas, bringing in more native woodlands, looking at species reintroduction, working with communities on that. So I think there's a lot more that we can do, but I think the key thing here is that there's a lot of money going in to support different forms of managing the land and we can do that in a way that supports nature emergency. I think in terms of setting up marine protected areas again that's something that we've really pushed for through the Scottish budgets and we've accelerated that uh, as Greens we've also got a ban on uh, dredging of kelp forests as well but if you're going to have protected areas then you need to protect them not just have paper parks where you're saying well this area is protected but you're not prepared to take enforcement action so I think, you know, parks need, protected areas need to be just that, they need to be protected. Thanks. Thank you. Um, next, we come to Jenny Gilworth. Thanks, Jack. Um, so we published the high level statement on intent on biodiversity um, in the programme for government back in December of last year. And that statement confirms our continuity and enhancement where it's possible of delivery under an existing biodiversity strategy. I suppose in terms of a specific example, back in 2019-20, uh, we, we did fall slightly short of our programme for government commitment to plant 12,000 hectares, um, but we exceeded the annual 10,000 hectares target for the current climate change plan and over 80% of the new woodland creation across the UK in 1920 was in Scotland. So I think that's an example of where we want to take things in terms of tree planting, which I know that Malcolm touched upon, but you are probably likely to see some similarity in terms of our responses to your answers uh, this evening, because there is, to my mind anyway, quite a good level of cross-party consensus when it comes to issues around biodiversity. Thank you. Um, and last but not least, we come to Alex Rowley. 
I'd unmute myself and just give me a shout if I'm running over. I would just, a, a few quick ones. Mark mentioned the land. If you look at who owns Scotland and land ownership across Scotland, my own view is that we should certainly be taxing the land a lot more and using those resources to plough back in because all of this costs money. Um, in terms of education and schools, which is an issue I know you're, you're quite big on, but if you look at, I mean, my example, I just have an allotment down the road in Kelty where I live. That's my hobby. But over the last number of years, the local primary schools have been involved. They've done a whole range of stuff, putting in logs, trees, attracting different species. And it's just brilliant. And if you are being encouraged and supported for primary school age to take that wider interest, then you'll do much more. So I would like to see a lot more in terms of education. I agree with the tree planting. Um, but, you know, let's involve people. People become more aware when they watch David Attenborough and some of the stuff on the TV. Let's involve young people, kids, for an early age. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, a very enlightening set of responses. Um, so I believe we've now got a third question concerning climate education, and that comes from Orla. Sorry, that took me a minute. Um, so as students, we feel education on the climate crisis and its injustices it will bring about has been neglected in our education. How would you ensure that every student receives a comprehensive education on these issues? And would you prioritize this as a local representative? Thank you very much. Um, as young people, education, as you can imagine, is an incredibly important issue to us. And if you take the climate crisis, you know, something else that we're very interested in as a generation um, something that I think is pressing for a lot of young people not just in mid Scotland and Fife but across Scotland and even the world and um, so for this question we'll start with Mark Ruskell. So I think my starting point here would be to listen to you about whether you think within a kind of formal education setting be it a college or a school you feel that climate is being covered adequately. I certainly know some excellent teachers that are doing some amazing project work working within local communities on this, but I would be guided by you as to whether we need to strengthen educational guidance on that and train up teachers and educators so they can do more of that work. I think though a critical thing for me is that education isn't just about our schools, it's about what we do when we're protesting, it's about what we do when we're out in our communities, tree planting or understanding what the impacts are of climate change. So I would see education in a much broader way. And I think involving communities in that, if we've got climate action, climate action towns, for example, as we're seeing across the region, places like Blairgarry, Aberfeldy have got climate action towns. There's opportunities there for everybody to get involved in understanding what the impacts of climate change are on our communities, but also what we can do locally to tackle that. And I think that sort of feeds into to one other thing I would say, which is the need to get citizens together to learn together and propose solutions together. That's why I pushed for a citizens assembly uh, to be set up through the Climate Change Act, which brings together people to design their own solutions across Scotland to climate change. And I think that in itself is a really great educational opportunity for us, but for, for, for communities as well, to think together about what the solutions are. So yeah, I think there's formal education, but there's also more of a kind of popular education about how we can actually tackle this working together. Thank you. Uh, just um, hitting the border of the time there. Um, so next we come to Jenny Gilruth. Thanks, Jack. So in terms of the SMP, um, I'm going to probably put my teacher hat on here and say that I know that we teach in schools at the moment about issues around about learning for sustainability. And primarily that's probably delivered by geography teachers. But I think there's more we could be doing and certainly in recent years the more moves from young people in terms of activism around climate change I think present a challenge to the education system to think differently about how we teach about these concepts and make them meaningful to young people um, and I know that um, Teach the Future Scotland have already met with the Deputy First Minister on this and raised this matter but in my own role we support in the Scottish Government the development education centres which teach about sustainability so I'm keen at the moment to look at how those centres can help provide opportunities for young people and for teachers in terms of teacher training to teach about issues around climate change and the second thing I think we should be looking at is COP26 
and how we support teaching around COP26 and the issues that's going to bring up in local communities, obviously in Glasgow, but right across Scotland. Um, I see I have 30 seconds left. We in the Scottish Government supported learning around about the Commonwealth Games back in 2014. We funded a development officer in Education Scotland, and I think we should be looking to do something similar potentially for COP26 to ensure that message gets out there. But fundamentally, it's the job of every political party, I think, to work with the teaching profession on this because there's a real appetite out there from young people to learn about issues around about climate change. So it's the job of us to make that easier for them at this moment in time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we come to Alex Rowley. Thank you, Jack. I, I, I think one of the things we need to look at is the curriculum and what, what level of education around this is in the curriculum. Um, one of my daughters is a teacher at, at Inverkeaton High School, and I know that pre-COVID, she would regularly have classes up at Lahore Meadows Country Park doing stuff up there and talking about climate. So I know it's in the curriculum, but to what extent it's in the curriculum and to what extent we need to do more within the, the curriculum, I think, so that it's, it's, it's fixed, it's there. So that, that if we really want to make change then in terms of education, then that's what we need to do, I would seem to me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and finally, we come to Malcolm Wood. Thank you. Um, my answer is, is very simple, um, which is just to endorse what Teach the Future um, is asking for. Um, and the, my Liberal Democrat colleague, uh, Councillor James Calder, recently got Fife Council to agree to a motion um, uh, proposing that climate change education be properly embedded into the curriculum and also into teacher training. Um, and that motion was adopted unanimously by Fife Council which I think is worth um, taking note of in itself, because for the three decades or so that I've been aware of climate change and thinking about it, um, it's been almost impossible to have a serious discussion about climate change without somebody insisting that it's not a real thing. They're, they'll say, um, you know, there's no greenhouse effect and we can mess with the, the chemistry of our atmosphere all we like and it won't change a thing. Um, but now, at least on Fife Council and in panels like this, um, we don't have anyone like that. And I think that's a real step forward that we can get onto properly talking about what we can do about climate change and not just, is it real? Thank you. Again, a number of very interesting points raised that I've seen um, many young people um, raise questions on within the Q&A box as well. Um, so that's us halfway through the pre-prepared questions. Um, our next question concerns youth engagement and that comes from Tess. Yes, yeah, so um, as young people across Scotland, we're more aware than ever of the impact of the government's actions on, on our lives and, and young people's lives. With regards to both COVID-19 and the climate crisis, um, young people are engaging with decision makers. However, we're aware that this engagement is often used as a token for youth involvement rather than as a way to truly acknowledge the concerns of Scotland's youth. How will you ensure that your engagement with young people is more than just a checkbox? Thank you. Um, again, a really important point to be raising, especially with um, the debate surrounding the incorporation of the UNCRC in Article 12 and children's rights to be heard and issues that affect them. Um, so for this question, we will start with Jenny Gilruth. Thanks, Jack. I think that's a really good question and probably you might all think that politicians are only interested in young people's views around about, um, you know, election times. But um, for me as a, a former modern studies teacher, it's really important to hear from the views of young people. Um, I think they are often very good at telling us as politicians um, not necessarily what we want to hear. They, they give usually some pretty difficult questions when I go out to visit schools. So I think visiting schools in normal times is a way you can make yourself accessible to young people. I've certainly contacted all the high schools in my constituency at the start of the pandemic and said, if you want me to come and speak to any of your modern studies classes, I'm happy to do that. I usually would in Parliament. So you make yourself accessible. Um, I've also held surgeries in all the high schools that I represent. I think that's a really important way you can listen to the views of young people. And they'll come and they'll tell you exactly what they think about the local area in which you represent. And it's a really good opportunity as a politician to make sure that you're listening to the views of young people and that you're doing it regularly. So I've done that on a number of occasions. As I would definitely recommend it to everyone else um, who's on the panel. I see I have 30 seconds left. And then in terms of that tokenism, I think it is a challenge. But in, in the Scottish 
parliament elections, remember those people who are 16 and over can vote in these elections. So there is an opportunity through your education system to have the chance really to, to use that, whether that's in modern studies or more broadly in terms of citizenship, um, to ask your politicians into schools, to ask them questions and to hold us to account. So I see it as a two way process. We should make ourselves available to you as young people, but equally you should hold our feet to the fire. And I guess that's what events like this are about and are really important for that reason, not just during election periods. Thank you. Um, so next we move on to Alex Rowley. I would make three quick points, I think. Firstly, during the last climate strike, I um, attended a gathering up in Creef and it was quite incredible for me it was enlightening because it wasn't just the secondary school pupils who were there and were very loud and vocal and making making clear the points that they wanted to make but then the primary school arrived and indeed some nursery kids arrived it was just absolutely amazing that morning in grief um, so action is part of that, but key to that is education. And therefore, I come back to the point about embedding it in the curriculum so that that, that, that education is there and people are understanding the different arguments and, and what some countries are doing better than others. Um, I finish by saying that when I was leader of Fife Council, Fife had the highest level of recycling in Scotland. And I was convinced the reason for that was the work that the primary schools did through the eco schools and other things like that. And the kids were going home and saying to their parents and, and, and educating the parents on recycling. Absolutely convinced that that's what happened. It was the work of the schools that got five, uh, that, that, that kudos at that time. Thanks. Thank you. Um... Next, we move on to Malcolm Wood. I would say, um, I would push this question back again and say it's not what we can do, it's what you can do. And the thing you can do is to vote. And of course, you're going to vote anyway, but to make sure your friends vote and everybody your age votes, because there's a, there's a bias in this country towards the older half of society. And at least part of the reason for that, I think, is that, young, that not so many younger people vote. Um, so yes, turn out to vote, get your friends to turn out to vote. Also join a political party. The policies of our political parties are made by their members and an awful lot of the members and people in conferences are people with gray hair. More younger voices in conferences would lead to more young people friendly policies. Um, yeah, that's my answer. Thank you. And finally, we move to Mark Ruskell. Yeah, I think there are lots of different ways to get your voice across and get involved in democracy. But one way to do that is to actually stand for election. And we don't have enough young people represented in councils, represented uh, in parliament. Um, I, I did move uh, in an elections bill in, in parliament. I floated the idea of 16 year olds being allowed to stand for election. So not just being able to vote, but stand for election. I think we're still a little bit away from being able to move to that point but it's something that I, th I hope and I think will come in the years ahead but I think there's lots of other ways to get involved I've seen you know young people getting involved in community councils in Scotland that are important they are talking about local environmental issues and they're not often making decisions about things as well um, but I think protest movements are another form of democracy and I've been amazed at some of the groups of young people who've been campaigning for certain things like the, the uh, ban on kelp dredging that we brought forward in the Scottish Parliament came partly as a result of a group called Ellipool Sea Savers, who are a group of young people who are doing active campaigns in the northwest of Scotland to protect their marine environment. Absolutely inspiring. They're working with the community. So there's lots of different ways to get involved in politics. And I think, you know, you just need to get your voices heard and, and challenge us and then get onto this side of the table. Thank you. Um... That again, another really intriguing discussion that I hope will generate some questions that we can um, bring to you later on. Um, so our fifth question tonight um, comes from Caroline and it concerns buildings. Even new buildings are not always being built to be carbon efficient. Despite the obvious need for emissions to be cut, looking forward, how would you be carbon efficient? 
emission and where possible carbon neutral. Um, I think we had a bit of a interception with the tech and um, did all of our politicians catch that? Is it um, so I'll just, well? Oh, sorry. Is it in the chat box as well, I think? Uh, yes, it is. Oh, um, fantastic. So um, if we're all OK to proceed with the question, um, we will be starting with Alex Rowley. OK, well, I mean, you, you could, we have the powers in the Scottish Parliament have not been used to to introduce, you could introduce uh, guidance immediately that all new builds are built carbon neutral. Um, that hasn't happened. Uh, the when the chair of the, the, the climate committee came to the environment committee in the Scottish Parliament, when I was on that, I remember him saying he couldn't understand why we just didn't do that. So, so there's one thing there you could do immediately with all new builds. Um, secondly, we do have a housing crisis in Scotland. The biggest mailbag I have and continually have is people struggling to be able to get a, a safe, warm house a roof over their head. Um, so we need to tackle that. We've made good progress um, over the years, but boy, do we need to make more progress. So so those are two actions right away. And that, that, that brings you to that point about actions speak louder than words. Um, I've no doubt that housing developers would have a massive lobby running if, if we were to say that all new builds should be carbon neutral, but we've got the powers to do that. And today, no, 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 no um, political party has has achieved that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and next, we move on to Malcolm Wood. I largely agree with Alex. There, what we need is government incentives and regulations, if necessary, about insulation and about how we heat our buildings. Um, I pass a depressing number of houses when I'm out for a walk that still have single glazing. Um, and and this is it's just not about poverty because some of these houses have very big shiny cars outside, um, and so this is a matter of persuading people that what they should spend their money on is insulating their homes better than they do, uh, in some cases. Uh, also, the way we heat our homes, a lot of us are currently dependent on gas boilers, uh, and of course there's an aim to to not to be dependent on on natural gas from the North Sea. That's going to require us to change the way we heat our homes. Uh, electric heat pumps, uh, the fairly new idea of heat networks is a, are all ideas that could be pushed forwards with government um, intervention. Uh, there's also the matter of schools. Some of our school buildings are old drafty things. The, the, the school I went to in Inverkeething um, was a drafty single glazed place uh, and it's still as far as I know a drafty single glazed place badly in need of being replaced uh, and I hope it will be replaced soon with uh, ideally a carbon neutral, beautifully insulated, um, shiny new building. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we move on to Mark Ruskell. So I think we know what to do. We know that driving up building standards really high will make a difference. We know that investment into renewable energy uh, whether that's you know air source heat pumps driven by renewable electricity or biomass boilers or other technology, uh, solar panels will really, really help. The, the, the problem here is about political will. So the political will to drive up standards, to challenge the house builders who obviously want to build more houses, but at a cheaper cost so they can make more profit. The other issue here is about funding and choices. So you know, my party has had constructive discussions with the SNP government over the years about putting more and more money into energy efficiency. But I think, you know, we're only scratching the surface at the moment. We need to go a lot further. And it will come to a point where governments need to make a decision. Do they want to put more money into building road infrastructure or do you want to put money into other forms of infrastructure like our homes and energy efficiency, which can actually cut carbon? So there are choices for government to make here, but we need to prioritize this. It's hugely important, and not least because so many people in Scotland live in fuel poverty in one of the most renewable energy rich countries in the entire world. Thank you. Um, and finally, we move to Jenny Gilruth. 
Thanks, Jack. Um, so in terms of, I suppose, Alex's point with regard to the government being more ambitious, I'm, I'm an SNP politician, so I'm, I'm going to maybe take a different view on this. I mean, I think we need to also look at where powers are reserved, so including in terms of the gas network, energy market reforms, and also on consumer protection. At the moment, we're consulting on a, a draft heat and building strategy, which sets out our actions to support the transformation of Scotland's building stock over the next 24 years. But, you know, the issues around about biomass, for example, have been touched upon. So I live in Mark Inch and uh, at the former Tillichussel paper mill um, site, we now have a biomass plant. Now, that biomass plant was built with Scottish government money and also European money. And there was a little bit of funding from the council as well. And that biomass plant helps at the moment um, to heat some homes in Glenossis, but it also heats uh, a lot of five council buildings. So there's an opportunity, I think, to work better and more efficiently, but we need to make the biomass, I suppose, work for the people that live in Glenrothes as well. And, and sometimes with some of these uh, issues, um, we don't necessarily see the, the payback to local communities. And I think we need to work harder at making sure that does happen, particularly when we're talking about improving the quality of homes. And Alec also touched upon that. It's an issue that comes into my mailbag regularly too, because we have a number of um, housing developments in Glenrothes which were built maybe 50, 60 years ago now, and some of them really need that investment, they need that transformative change in terms of heating, and I see I have 10 seconds left, so I will pause there. Thank you all so much. Um, we've sped through this uh, at a rapid pace, so we will have some time for um, some of the questions within the Q&A box um, at the end. Um, however, we do have one more pre-prepared question, um, and that concerns uh, the green recovery, um, and that's going to come from Orla tonight. Um, so on Wednesday, the UK budget was announced laying out funding for our recovery from COVID-19. Many feel that this recovery budget was too far from, removed from the ongoing climate crisis, as opposed to a recovery which tackles both the COVID and climate crises. With consideration to the budget, how would you plan to rebuild the economy in a way which will ensure Scotland reaches its carbon neutrality targets? Thank you. And um, a very topical question, maybe more so than um, the other questions that we've had tonight, considering that the budget was only two days ago. Um, so Malcolm Wood, we will start with you now. Thank you. Uh, that's a good question. My party's slogan for this election is put recovery first. Um, and we're talking about recovery from the COVID crisis. Um, we hope to stimulate the economy um, and produce jobs, preferably green jobs. Uh, this is a, a good moment to start trying to make the transition from um, the natural gas, the oil extraction in the North Sea, uh, towards renewable energy. There's lots of people with the skills, the engineering skills, um, and the time is right to start creating jobs in the renewable energy sector for the people that um, whose, whose jobs are ultimately not sustainable in, in the North Sea. Um, the the plant at Moss Moran uh, near Cowdenbeath being a, being a fine example. Um, we um, yeah, there's my answer. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Um, we will now move on to Mark Ruskell. So I think it would be a mistake at the moment to invest in the extraction of more and more oil and gas in the North Sea. But you know this is clearly part of the UK government's approach and the Scottish government support that as well. I think we do need to draw a line under North Sea oil and gas exploration. Um, certainly this is what the New Zealand government have done and they're doing it because they recognize that it would be unfair on those communities if you suddenly reach a point in say 10 or 15 years time where that industry collapses because of global demand and climate change. We need to start planning now for the transition. And we need to start investing now in that transition to support those communities and make sure nobody is left behind. So I think it's possible to do that. You might have heard of the idea of a Green New Deal. It does require the state to invest in industries of the future, particularly renewable energy. And we've got some great examples there uh, within Fife and the opportunity for new industries to come in. I'm very excited by the electric train manufacturer, Talgo, that's looking to move into West Fife, bringing new engineering jobs into the area. But it will require governments to intervene here. And there's good track record from the past. You know, back after the Second World War, we had an amazing development of renewable energy, the hydro schemes in Scotland. Um, so it is possible uh, to do that. But I think 
also um, Scotland, I would say, are, is constrained by the financial fiscal powers that we have. If we were an independent state, we'd have more of those powers to be able to lever in that investment. And that is one of the reasons that my party uh, supports independence, because to get that energy transition, we need all the powers of a small independent state able to operate on a global stage, but able to have the power to invest in that green recovery. Thank you. Um, now we will move on to Jenny Gilruth. So I think we need to prepare and, and plan for our net zero transition in a way that really mitigates um, and maximises the opportunities of that green recovery that we've spoken about um, this evening. I mean, the examples of given of oil and gas um, and the jobs that that industry still supports to this day are well made. We need to ensure that transition also supports jobs that are green in that recovery. And I think in particular, my brother-in-law works offshore and there's lots of men in, in, uh, in predominantly, but there are smaller numbers of women that work offshore. So when we think about how we build that green recovery, we need to make sure there are opportunities uh, on the back of that recovery to replace these jobs when we move away from that type of um, production. The climate change plan, as I mentioned, was published back in December, and that sets out our plan or our route map, as it were, for that transition. Um, that plan itself is going to look to establish a, a Green Jobs Workforce Academy, where, which builds on the lessons of the, the National Transition Training Fund and also on a Young Persons Guarantee. Thank you. Um, and our final response to the pre-prepared questions will come from Alex Rowley. Yeah, I think regardless of the constitutional setup in, in, in Scotland, the bottom line is that it needs a political will. And I just gave you examples earlier where we could have uh, tackled housing and, and emissions, and we haven't. So it needs political will. My politics is always uh, is also that I believe in a much greater role for the state. So if you if you look at a company like in Falkirk, Alexander Dennis, who made the the green buses, and then you look at the rhetoric of politicians in Scotland and in London and England. Who all say we want this 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 new fleet of buses? Well, if you had direct state intervention there, then you would have brought both of those things together. I should say to you that the trade unions, when 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 you talk to them about things like removing gas boilers, etc., their view is it's all pie in the sky, because they have saw that we have not seen jobs. You know, we were told that Scotland would be the Saudi Arabia. Of, of renewables by 2020, it has not happened. So if we're serious about this, it needs political will to be able to drive it. And it needs a recognition that there needs to be a greater role for the state. Otherwise, all these sort of statements just pile down to rhetoric. We have powers now that we're not using to do that. But if you cannot guarantee people's jobs, um, you've got China, you've got Japan building more coal, coal fire power stations, opening more mines. Germany doesn't intend to get rid of its coal fire power stations till 2038. So right around the world, there are jobs. If we say here we're going to get rid of all our jobs because we want we want uh, a, a cleaner climate and then we're going to drive people into poverty, we'll get no place. So I would say cut the rhetoric, start to get your politicians to focus and do what powers, use the powers they've got. Thank you so much. Um, that brings us to the end of our prepared questions for tonight. Um, we are now going to move on to a number of questions that have come in from the chat box. And I believe Tess will be asking the first of these. Yeah, um, so this question, sorry, let me just find it. I've lost the question here. Okay, um, what will your parties do to ensure that we address the social justice issues that are associated with and fueled by the climate emergency, framing environmental breakdown as a political, social and cultural issue? Thank you. Um, I think if we just continue with the cycle that we've been going through to make sure that everyone has a chance to speak um, in a particular order, that would be the best way to go. So, uh, Mark Ruskell. So, uh, I think one thing that COVID has shown us is that poverty and inequality uh, is rife in our society and it's widened as a result of COVID, uh, but it's also widening as a result of the climate crisis as well. And that's clear globally, as well as within our own societies. So 
we need to make sure that every policy that we design to tackle the climate crisis also tackles inequality within our society as well. And it's about looking for win-win. So it's about looking for those opportunities to take people out of fuel poverty by investing in warmer, cleaner, greener homes. It's about saying that if we're serious about enabling young people and invite everybody to travel on public transport, then we need to ensure that public transport is accessible and, and that it's affordable as well. And we need to create good, well-paid, unionized jobs in the new industries of the future as well and ensure that we get a just transition and that people leaving jobs, whether that's at Moss Moran or in the oil and gas sector or whatever, are entering into well-paid, unionized jobs for the future. So it needs to be at the core of everything that we're doing. Thank you. Um, Danny Gilruth. So I think that's a really good question. I mean, I think the pandemic makes us all reflect on um, society in terms of who has power and who doesn't. And Mark talked about the impact of austerity and certainly in my own constituency, as we build back from the pandemic, the reality of poverty, which was already deeply ingrained in some of the parts of the constituency I represent, um, has only got worse. So you need to, as politicians, make climate change real to everyone that you represent. And I think that there's a challenge there. One of the things we've touched upon this evening is education. I think that's hugely important. So schools have got a huge role to play here, and I recognise your work in that respect. And then secondly, you need to make um, things like recycling easy for people. So in fact, we're actually quite good. We've got a really good, I would say, um, approach to recycling in terms of how the council does collections. So there are ways in which local authorities can play a role in that and they can make the issues around about climate change real to people um, and make those kind of social justice issues that Kyle's touched upon more relevant um, at a local level. So I hope that kind of to some extent answers your, your question there, Kyle. It's a, it's a very good question, though. Thank you. Um, next up, Alex Rowley. Yeah, I mean, I would say to you to go back and look at the the committee stage two of the fuel poverty bill, the local government committee in the parliament. Um, I think the target is something like eradicate fuel poverty by 2040 something. And for me, that was, was, was just not ambitious enough. Uh, so that again, an example of politicians saying we should do all these things, but actually, you know, we're, we're, we're not doing them. I believe we could tackle the, a lot of the issues around fuel poverty, bad, bad buildings and housing to the previous question. And we could do that a lot sooner if there was a political will and, of course, the money to put into it. And that's an area where you would create a lot of jobs in the process, just like if you had a massive new house building program, then you would create a lot there. But crucially, I think it is about major investment in skills, training and jobs. Because right now, if we had those types of industries, if we were investing all that money into infrastructure and housing, etc., we would not have the skills. We've been trying to get people to come from other countries with their skills to work here and do that type of work for years. So I'll finish by saying, you know, we need to invest in skills. We need to invest in people who are the greatest asset. OK, thank you very much. Um, Malcolm Wood. Thank you. Um, I agree with the premise of the question, which is that uh, climate change will affect the poorest most. Um, I think that means we have even more of a moral duty to try and stop it. Um, I think it also means that we have to start asking seriously um, about uh, not just how can we stop it, but if we fail, how, how are we going to survive it? Um, and while stopping climate change is a global question, we rely on all the other countries to, to chip in. Asking how we can deal with climate change and so, some climate change is going to happen, how we can deal with it. That's a local thing which we can deal with at the, at the Scottish level. Um, and, and the beauty of it is, I think, that some of the things are, this, are the same things. Planting trees to su suck up carbon also helps with preventing flooding. Flooding is the sort of thing that wrecks lives. Um, or, uh, improving home insulation is the sort of thing that reduces carbon emissions, also reduces heating costs, helping the poorest. Um, so um, I think this is something we need to ask of our politicians, as well as what are we doing to stop climate change, but also how, what are we doing to, to cope with it when it happens? And as the question asks, 
um, deal with the social justice aspect. Thank you. Um, so our next question is coming from, I believe it's Orla that it's coming from. Um, so do your parties support carbon neutrality by 2030 and do you accept that this is a maximum deadline for reducing our emissions as laid out by the IPCC and that 2045-2050 is too late? Thank you. Definitely a very specific question there. Um, so our first answer will come from Jenny Gilruth. Well, I'm going to be totally honest with you. I don't know the answer to that question, so I'm going to have to find out for you. I'm, I'm not going to pretend to be a politician on this very specific question um, with regard to our targets, so I'll have to come back to you. Thank you. Um, Alex Rowley. Yeah, I mean, again, like Jenny, her manifesto has not been produced, but I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought so. In terms, of, in terms of 2030, I think we've got to be honest and realistic around what we're going to achieve. Um, we need to set out a very clear plan for, for, for how we're going to achieve that. Um, but exactly what our manifesto is going to say on this, it's, it's not my brief, but I would have thought that would be, um, that would be um, fairly difficult. Uh, not unachievable, but you've got to be able to link the jobs the reason Scotland has done so well, if you remember, and our, 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 our missions have come down so well is because Longanet Power Station closed and look at the emissions that was pouring out of that. So the next, we've, we've, we've grabbed the low lying fruit, if you like, the next steps are going to be much, much tougher and they must result in jobs. So we need to be honest and realistic about where we're, and what we're going to achieve. But specifically what our manifesto will say, I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Malcolm Wood. My party um, pushed recently the, thing, the 2019 Act in, in the Scottish Government on, um, on climate change. We pushed for the, the target in reductions to be from reducing by 75% to, or reducing from 70 to up to reducing by 75%. So, um, again, like your other panelists, I don't know exactly what my party's current policy is but I imagine that we wouldn't be supporting that we would say it was too ambitious that these plans need to be cr credible they need to be radical and credible and I think that the 75 percent um, target we've got at the moment is is radical and credible it's possible that carbon neutrality by 2030 is is just not credible that if the, the steps we would need to take to get there um, would be so drastic that what we'd end up with is a change of government that people wouldn't vote for it we couldn't take people along we'd end up with a different government that didn't support it thank you um finally we move to mark roskell so i think we need to be as ambitious as we can be and that's why i moved an amendment to the climate act um, to set an 80 percent by 2030 target however i think targets are only part of the picture here because if you set a domestic target you're also ignoring the 80% of our emissions that come from overseas. So what we actually need here is a consumption target. And I think one of the issues is, you know, you could set a net zero target by 2025 if you wanted, but one of the results of that would be that all of our industry would go overseas and we'd simply be contributing to somebody else's target. So we, we someone else's over, over consumption. So we need to get to grips with this. And I think consumption targets are one way forward. We need to accelerate the action to deliver the ambitious target that we've got in the Climate Act at, at the moment. Um, but some of these solutions, particularly tree planting and things like that, do take time to come through. But yeah, let's be as ambitious as we can. Thank you. Um, so our next question, I believe, comes from Caroline. How will you ensure new train services don't cause the environmental disruption? And so I think we had another um, little glitch there. Um, for the sake of time, I'll just repeat the question. How will you ensure that new train services don't cause the environmental destruction seen by HS2? And so for this question, we'll start with Alex Rowley. 
Well, the first interesting thing is that if you look at, as I said earlier, in, in Scotland, you had these these train lines running every place and, and you had a, a first class service that in the 60s, the Beecham report, I believe it was, and, and you ended up getting getting rid of these, these lines. So to what extent those lines are still there, to what extent you look at trams, if you go to most European cities, you can whirl around the whole of the city and, and, and it doesn't cost much, etc. So we're we're way behind in that. I think a couple of issues. One is that I know the transport secretary told me some some months ago now when I talked to him about the electrification of the five circle route that he didn't think that would happen, that hydrogen trains would be the answer there. Um, whereas when I speak to the, 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 the um, trade unions, the, the transport trade unions, they say that they don't believe that to be the case. So there's a bit of work to be done on that in terms of electrification, whether hydrogen trains are the right thing, I don't know. Um, where we're putting in new train lines, and, and, and you've heard the day about St Andrews and Leavenmouth, uh, but we could do a lot more of that once we know what's down. It's about looking at what's there, what we can protect, and where we need to put new uh, lines in uh, moving forward. Thank you. Um, next, we move on to Malcolm Wood. Thanks for the question. Um, environmental destruction. Um, yes, I think we should compare it to the alternatives. That, I mean, the environmental destruction of a six-lane motorway is is on an entirely larger scale than a train line. Um, I'm all in favour of of um, sensitively adding train lines to the to the um, countryside without um, destroying significant sites. Um, I'm in favour of of trains, even if they have to make new train lines through the countryside. Um, the alternative, of course, being for getting people around, being cars or or airplanes, even worse. Um, something. One one of the scandals of climate change, I, I think, is that um, aviation fuel is not taxed in the same way that fuel on, for ground travel is, is taxed. Um, traveling by train is currently very expensive compared to traveling by plane. I would like to see, um, I hope this is something that can come up at COP26, is aviation fuel taxed um, as it ought to be compared to traveling on land. Thanks. Thank you. And um, we move on to Mark Ruskell. So I think that every single major bit of infrastructure we're building needs to be assessed against its environmental impact. And we need to be very careful. And I think if there are ancient woodlands as there are on the HS2 route, then they should have a protected status that ensures that they are actually protected. And I know people have been you know, going down there to, to protest at the HS2 sites. Uh, and, and I think they're right to do that. And I think you know, when it comes to rail infrastructure, it's important that we're investing in a way which is actually going to benefit communities. So some of the rail campaigns we've been supporting, like at Newborough, St Andrews, Leavenmouth, Aller to Dunfermline route, you know, these are good campaigns. They're going to benefit communities and they're using, by and large, existing infrastructure and they've got good routes to be able to do that. HS2 is not in that ballpark. It's very much a point to point railway, which is going to deliver high speed links. And there may be some environmental benefits in terms of aviation, but overall, it's not going to serve communities and it's probably the wrong transport priority. We should be investing in connecting communities through rail. Thank you. And finally, we move to Jenny Gilruth. Thanks, Jack. I mean, I think in terms of the environmental destruction that new rail lines can cause, we need to look at the specifics of where you're talking about. So we've all mentioned, for example, Leavenmouth today. Um, and in my own constituency, there are an old, there's an old creosote works at the back of where the rail link is going to reopen. So that's being looked at in terms of the environmental impact at the moment uh, by Transport Scotland and also by Network Rail um, in terms of what they can do with that site. And it has to be done very carefully. But it also has to be done in consultation with the community. I think that's hugely important. So the uh, Transport Scotland at the moment and Network Rail are engaged in consulting with the, uh, with the constituency. They're trying to do that online as best they can, of course, because of COVID-19. I think that's important as well when you're talking about any environmental impacts that will harm the local community. And then with regard to the electrification of the line, which Alec touched upon, I know that the new line is being built with um, the electrical capability within it. Of course, Fife is not yet electrified and we may yet get there. We hope to get there soon. Um, but whether it's uh, electric or whether it's hydrogen, we need to work at creating a, a cleaner approach to our, our real network. And Fife is not yet there yet. Thank you. Um, 
So I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, our next question, I believe, comes from Tess. Yeah, so I think um, this was touched on earlier, um, but how can your parties ensure actions towards the targets that they're setting? A target is only as good as what you want to as what you do to achieve it and we don't have time for hollow promises which is a theme in the Fridays for Future Youth climate strikes um, and that came from a 17 year old climate striker and activist with Fridays for Future Scotland. Thank you um, so our first answer will come from Malcolm Wood. Thank you uh, that's a good good question I think it's a very important question because for all my life I've seen targets appear about climate change and they get missed and I think Scotland is currently missing targets on biodiversity and recycling and landfill and things. Um, <clears throat> so <sighs> what we need is a detailed plan. A, a target for 2030 is all very well but I want to see um, plans for what's going to happen at each stage, how we're going to measure what we're going to do if we are not achieving uh, the steps we plan to take. We also need to stop getting distracted. There's always something that seems more immediate than climate change. This is the, um, this is the whole difficulty with climate change is that it seems, still seems far off. And if you're, if you're already quite old, it may seem irrelevant. Um, there's distractions of, of Brexit or a pandemic or talking about more independence uh, in referendums. We need to keep our focus on climate change because it, it does matter so much. Um, we, we really mustn't get this one wrong. Oh, and um, COP26 is, is going to be crucial. We must, uh, we must sh show Scottish leadership on this and, and at the same time keep our fingers crossed for, uh, for a good agreement from the, the bigger countries. Thank you. And we now move to Mark Ruskell. So I've been looking in Parliament at the climate change plan update, which has been set now to try and meet that new target of 70%, 75% by 2030. And, I, and I'm disappointed about it because I think, you know, there are some changes in there and it's all about making, say, farming more efficient or making the oil and gas sector a bit more energy efficient. But there's no real fundamental shifts. Um, and I think this is where, you know, we, we need to see the change coming forward. We need to see action. So there's no action, for example, on dietary change, which we know we're going to have to tackle at some point. We're going to have to incentivize dietary change if we're to meet climate targets. There's no discussion about the future of the oil and gas sector post oil. And I think, you know, we need to get to grips with this as politicians because you can't tackle climate change unless you have system change. And what I'm not seeing at the moment is the action from government that creates new systems new ways of, of doing things which will actually give us the option of tackling climate change. Thank you. We now move to Jenny Gilruth. Thanks Jack. I mean targets whether they are on climate change or elsewhere um, are for governments to meet and ultimately if you don't think a government has met their targets then you have the power at the ballot box to, to vote out parties or vote other parties in. So I think it's I suppose a matter of democracy. I mean, in terms of our approach to the climate emergency, you all know that Scotland was the first country in the world, or the UK rather, to declare a climate emergency. And we have, I think, some of the most ambitious climate change legislation in the world. But Mark's point about working harder, I'm not going to disagree with. And the, the point about dietary change, I know, is actually being looked at by the Minister for Public Health at the moment, Mary Goujon. Um, one of the things we did do, though, in terms of responding to the pandemic was um, to create a fund for spaces for people. And so that was nearly £40 million, pounds, I think, of funding to essentially give local authorities money to create space for people to move in areas which might have been previously dominated by cars, for example. So there are ways in which we've responded to the pandemic. Um, but on the point with regard to, to targets, I suppose that's for the voters to decide at the ballot box. Thank you. And finally, for this question, we move to Alex Rowley. I think belief. Um, you know, when I was when I was a teenager, I campaigned constantly for the introduction of a national minimum wage, and I remember standing handing out leaflets on the high streets and people telling me that would never happen. I mean, people were being paid in those days maybe fifty pence an hour, sometimes less. We eventually got that, that national minimum wage because we convinced people it was right that it should be increased higher, but we convinced them. Last year, the year before at the general election, when Jeremy Corbyn announced that he wanted free broadband 
right across the country. On national TV, on the national news, people mock them. They're not mocking now because suddenly now we can see that actually that was a bold policy that would, would, would be needed. So it's having the belief and it's building the support for that belief. As I said earlier, I believe strongly in the role of the state and I believe the, sto the state has to play a much greater role within the economy. Um, so it's a, bit, a, a mixture of those things, but ultimately it's about the belief and convincing people and campaigning for it. Just imagine if, if we, people got so excited over this issue as they do over the Constitution, then we would tackle the issue. Yep, thank you. I'm sorry, I just needed to cut you off there because of the time. Um, so we've got one more question, um, and it'd be um, great if we could squeeze it in. Um, and it comes from Orla, I believe. Um, yeah, so we have another carbon neutrality question, which is, what are your thoughts on the carbon neutrality of the school estate and the prioritisation of this set of public buildings above certain others? How can we expect our young people to learn about the climate emergency and climate justice if they're being educated in buildings that are contributing to that destruction? Thank you. Um, and so we now move to... I'm sorry, I've just lost a bit of track um, of who we're... We should be starting with. Um, sorry, shall we start with um, Malcolm Wood? Okay, I, I may have started last time. It doesn't matter. Um, yes, now I I uh, I did answer a bit about uh, the school estate with my old school being a, a drafty um, heat sink. Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> We education about the climate change climate change is important, um, and well, I hope that once I'm a very old man, um, we'll have we'll have educated your generation enough about climate change that when I'm a very old man, I can take my great grandchildren to a museum exhibition which will be about our our planet's climate change near miss, and it will tell the story of how catastrophic climate change was averted with the leadership of some young Scottish people like yourselves, um, maybe a, a talented engineer uh, who solved the problems of large scale carbon capture and storage, uh, how a, and a, you know, a young Scottish economist whose PhD thesis finally made the case that um, universal basic income would protect the low paid uh, and let, let them really focus on, on more important things like protecting their environment. Um, so and, and about how um, our climate change um, education about climate change led to these programs of adaptation and, and adjustment with planting trees and managing flood, flood defenses. Um, and and sorry, yeah, that's, just, that's my hope for your for sorry, my okay. future and yours. Thank you. Sorry. Um, okay, so can we move on to Mark Roskell? So I think one of the issues here is about the way that school buildings are procured in the way that they're they're built and they're designed, and I think. One of the concerns I had as a councillor was about the PFI, the kind of private finance initiative contracts, and that some of the buildings that were being, school buildings that were being built in my area were, were quite sort of, you know, like energy inefficient, poor quality. So I think we need to get that sorted going forward. Um, Alex will know that, you know, we're on this committee that we just dealt with a heat networks bill. Uh, in the Scottish Parliament, and there was opportunities there to ensure that all new public sector buildings, including schools, are connected where there's a heat load up to a heat network, which means that you've got the opportunity for low carbon renewable energy to be powering schools. Um, so I think there are opportunities there, um, but we need to, um, you know, push much harder on that and make sure that whenever governments are actually procuring new buildings, they're commissioning them, that they're the highest standards possible. Thank you. Um, we now move to Jenny Gilbreth. Thanks, Jack. Um, I don't know if we all went to school in drafty uh, Fife <laughs> high schools, but like Malcolm, I went to uh, to school um, in St Andrews. I went to Madras, and uh, Madras has been sold, and there's a new school that's going to open. I think next this summer, actually, it's scheduled to open. But I remember fundraising when I was at school to fix um, the holes that were in the ceiling uh, in the quad when you walked into Madras. And that was a five council run school. So the notion that we don't have, you know, school buildings that are fit for purpose is not something that's just happened um, to this generation. It's been happening for a long time. And I think that dates back to a lack of investment in the school estate. And in terms of carbon neutrality, I mean, I look, there's two high schools in Glenorthis which are 
poor. I just checked recently uh, in terms of their, their quality um, and they need desperately replaced, to be quite frank with you. So when we look to rebuild these schools, we do need to consider whether or not they're carbon neutral. And I was just checking this actually in terms of this question. So a commuting high school, which was rebuilt under the SNP in, in 2012, has a biomass boiler system and it has also solar water um, heating panels. So there's a, a good example of how you can rebuild the school estate and respond to the climate crisis too. Thank you. And last but not least, we move to Alex Rowley. Yeah, I'll be brief on this. <laughs> I mean, my point would be that I don't think you can retrofit every school in the school estate, and I'm not sure you would want to. So Malcolm's example, the Inverkeen High School, you would want to replace that. You would want to build a new school, and I understand Fife Council have taken a decision to build that new school in the side. And that's really, it's about the new school and how that new school is going to operate. Um, and that's true in a number of schools across the region. There is a need for a replacement for some of them. So retrofitting is not necessarily the answer. It may be, I look out my window at Kelty Primary School, it's the most beautiful building uh, that I can see right from my window. That was retrofitted, but it's not always the answer. But, you know, we're getting there and we need to build more schools and that needs investment. And like all these questions, the, the, the final question I would finish is, where is the money going to come from? And you need the political will to be able to raise the money in order to invest the money. Just like the failure of the Chancellor's budget this week, where there was very little in there for this agenda that we're talking about. Thank you. And that will bring our questions to a close. Um, so just thank you all for coming. Um, we have some responses from our panellists um, about the issues discussed tonight. Um, and I believe we're starting with Tess for this. Yeah, so um, it's really great to have heard the views and the promises of the politicians and um, here today. Um, I've really related to some of the points specifically I think Malcolm mentioned right at the beginning not dropping unprofitable bus services which has happened in my village and there are two buses a day now and um, so that that's really great to have heard and um, kind of mentioned and um, as well as many other points and um, as Jenny mentioned earlier it's great to hear that similar ideas and commitments to tackling the climate emergency are held across the parties. And I hope that these commitments are held in whatever, whatever cap capacity is possible, regardless of the outcome of the elections in May. I feel hopeful after these discussions that whoever represents me and my peers in the next parliamentary term will engage and listen to young people and will do everything that they can to fight climate change and include marginalised group in that fight and to make sure nobody is left behind. However, I do know that these promises made today and in other spaces may not amount to much in real terms. So I hope that these aren't just empty promises and that the real concerns of young people and wider society are addressed and the immediate action that is needed is taken to address the climate emergency and the huge injustices it will cause. So I thank you all for being here today. It's been really great to hear you and I hope that it will amount to something meaningful. Thank you. Um, Caroline, shall we move to you next? Um, thank you so much for your time and all of your answers. I find it really interesting to listen to and it's really encouraging to hear. Um, I specifically like the point that Alex made about kind of embedding climate education in the curriculum because for me personally in my school um, I do feel like if you get a good geography teacher then you've got a really good chance but say you don't take geography your teacher doesn't have quite an interest in the subject and isn't going to be equal on the matter um, and also uh, one of Malcolm's points really resonated with me that we need to stop to be something more pressing or more imminent to deal with um, but at the end of the day this is going to go away just because there's other things going on um, I hope that we can continue to work together and that you can keep listening to the voices of young people as you've done tackling the climate crisis as you've done today and 
I hope that it's not just empty promises, as Tess said, and um, as Mark, it not being rhetoric and us actually keeping those promises. I think we have another glitch on your end, Caroline. Um, sorry, Caroline, was that you finished? Um, there was another tech issue. I'm sorry, my Zoom's a bit all over the place. I don't know how much of that you got, but at the end I was just saying um, that I'm very much in support of the point that Mark made about this can't just be like a rhetoric and we actually need to put actions into place to put all these promises forward and this policy forward, but thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and finally, we move to Orla. Um, so firstly, thank you all for coming and showing that you do care about young people's voices and the climate crisis. All of your answers have been really encouraging and have given me hope. I especially appreciated Mark's point about a oh, response to Caroline's biodiversity question, saying the Scottish Greens would like to rewild areas of Mid-Scotland and Fife, as I think Scotland's natural biodiversity is really important. Um, so yeah, your answers have given me hope. However, since I first learned of this crisis, I have been continually disappointed by politicians and our leaders' lack of action and unfulfilled promises. And I think we all as young people came to this event looking for answers and hope. And although we got both, I think we can all agree that we will also leave feeling worried because these reassuring and hopeful conversations have happened before. And people and especially politicians talk about things they will do but have no intention of actually doing them. Um, so I hope this is not the case for all of you here tonight. And I hope you go away and remember that we, as young people, depend on you to bring about the change we can't as of now, because our future does depend on it and it's not our job to fix this. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so that concludes the contributions from our panellists. Um, I would just like to thank you all again um, for attending tonight. And um, tonight, what we've done is we've managed to start a conversation about issues that really matter to us. And that's something that I that, and that I think most young people greatly appreciate. There are 24 young people who are watching live on Zoom, and I presume there will be others on Facebook. So that's um, quite a number of young people who you've influenced tonight and who are likely to go away and um, mention what you've said and that you never know that could influence the outcome of the election. So the elections to the Scottish Parliament this year are arguably the most important so far. And to us, environmental protection needs to be at the top of the agenda. Something that I'm personally incredibly glad that we got to talk about tonight was meaningful engagement with young people. And I can think of no issue where that's more important than with the climate crisis. I've sat in so many meetings where I felt a bit like a rubber stamp, you know, just approving the ideas put forward to me by the adults who know best in the room. Just, they just want the token young person to say yes, make them too afraid to dissent or to even ask a question for fear of reprimand or exclusion. It can't be that way. Now, more so than ever, we are informed about political issues and we care deeply about them. This event is symptomatic of that. The fact that we're even here goes to show how passionate, how driven and how concerned we are taking the time to engage in this adult business to achieve our goals. But this conversation can't stop once we click leave. Each of us has a duty, decision makers to be proactive in listening to us, keeping our best interests at the fore and us young people to keep raising our voices on behalf of the generation that will inherit the world, keep holding you to account, keep pushing for that change. And once we go, even if we have been doing that already, we have to start taking it even more seriously. And I know I will be. And I believe that will be everything for tonight. So please um, feel free to leave. Um, and thank you all for attending once more. Thanks, Jack. That was great. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you very yes, much. Thank you.